The incredible Geek's Line Anthology series now covers the revered NES and the Famicom too. Is this the ultimate 8-bit Nintendo book? Let's find out. Hi everyone, John here. Today we have a look at Geek's Line Publishing's latest Nintendo Focus book in its anthology series. Though the latest, it's the earliest chronologically. For these anthology books on Nintendo consoles, they started with the Nintendo 64, moved forward to the GameCube, then two steps back to the Super NES, and now back to the NES. Like their other books, this is meant to be a look at every game in that console's library, once again regardless of region. So besides NES games, this book also covers the Japanese counterpart, the Famicom, and the Famicom Disk System as well. Besides being an encyclopedia of all playable software, there is also a comprehensive history lesson, a technical analysis of hardware, a catalog of controllers and accessories, and a gallery of PAL region and American box art. Unlike the other Nintendo-centric anthology books, which all originally came in pairs, the NES anthology has all of this in a single volume, a 616-page Tanuki Deluxe Edition. Let's take a look. Before we get into the reviews, we get 54 pages of Nintendo history. The first part, Butterfly Effect, is about how Nintendo went from a card manufacturer in 1889 and up to the 1983 release of the Famicom. While the overall history has been recounted many times before, including in other anthology books by Geek's Line Publishing, we do get more of a focus on the particular aspects that helped to eventually form the Famicom and the NES, including electrical optical toy guns and the laser clay shooting system, which were precursors of the Zapper. There were the color TV game consoles of the Pong era, before the advent of cartridges, the Game & Watch handheld games, and the rise and dominance of Donkey Kong in the arcades. Then, Life of the NES goes into the Famicom success, the attempt to bring it to America as the Nintendo Advanced Video System, or AVS, before it became the grey box that we all know as the NES, then its distribution to the rest of the world, and the integration into culture that has made Nintendo a powerful brand and a household name. The third history lesson, titled The NES is Dead, Long Live the NES, talks about its enduring legacy. There are elements of the Famicom's and NES's designs in special versions of GBA and 3DS handhelds. There are re-releases of certain NES games, not just verbatim, but as e-reader cards or found within Animal Crossing. There are portions of games featured in Super Smash Bros. Brawl, WarioWare, and NES Remix. There are compilations as well as notable remakes, and recent games deliberately taking an NES graphical style to evoke this era. Ending this are the releases of the NES Classic Edition, or NES Mini as it's known in Europe, and the Switch Online NES app. Then, we have 310 pages reviewing 1,374 NES or Famicom games, followed by 34 pages of 197 Famicom Disk System games, for a total of 1,571 games on 344 pages. That's an average of about 4.5 reviews per page. There's one page with 8 games, but this is an exception as you lump 4 Pachio Kun games together. Yes, this page is just pachinko games, and you know how I feel about them if you've seen my Super NES book reviews. But normally, pages have 2 to 7 reviews. Unlike other books in the series, which were more generous with highlighting the most popular games by giving them a whole page or more, there are only 7 games that get this honor here. The 3 Super Mario Bros. games, the 3 Castlevania games, and Kid Icarus. That's it. Seriously. The Zelda games don't get a page of themselves, and neither does Metroid. None of the Mega Man, Ninja Gaiden, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games are worthy either. Now, Geek's Line Publishing is European, which might explain why games are actually listed by their European titles. However, this was not an issue with their other anthology books, so it is strange that they didn't follow through here. I noticed 28 games that have different names, depending on which side of the Atlantic you were on. Now, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles aren't going to be displaced much alphabetically when listed as the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles, as they are known in Europe. Besides, there is occasionally a slight shuffle of reviews to make them fit due to their different sizes, so it's not perfectly alphabetical, but at least it's close. Same with changes like the Bugs Bunny Blowout, dropping the birthday part of the title, or Ghosts and Goblins, being just a single ghost in Europe for some reason, and both of these bother me more than they should. But at least they wouldn't have moved much, and you would still find them if you were searching alphabetically anyway. But, if you wanted to read about certain games like Contra and its sequel Super C, then you'd have to know that here, they are known as Probotector and Probotector 2 Return of the Evil Forces. This is especially jarring when Contra is referred to as Contra, as opposed to Probotector, a few times in other reviews, and Contra Force, having no other name, is listed where you'd expect it, but with no Contra before it, which you'd probably notice, and wonder why it seems missing until you read 160 pages later. And Contra is absolutely classic, while nobody cares about Contra Force. Many books of this type, including the other anthology books, 
have a star rating from 0 to 5 in each game's review, but this time around, there is no such ranking scale. Instead, there are three icons, a star, a heart, and a skull. Or there could be no icon at all. As explained on the page before the reviews, a star is for great classics or essentials, a heart is for interesting or original yet little known games, and a skull is for horrible titles. Many of these skull earning titles are licensed games, unsurprisingly. But notice that Friday the 13th, also based on a movie and infamously considered one of the worst games of all time, does not get a skull here. That's right, this book actually sees some value in this game, and I sort of agree that its horribleness has been exaggerated. Anyway, while using stars, hearts, and skulls as an interesting idea in theory, there are many instances where I was scratching my head. It's one thing to have a 0 to 5 star grade and be like, okay, sure, it's objective. But when stars are for essentials and heart is for little known games that are underestimated and sometimes forgotten, that is a more rigid definition. So why do games like Super Mario Bros. 2 and Super Mario Bros. 3 get a heart? How on earth are Super Mario Bros. 2 and 3 little known? Are you kidding me? Aside from these, if the heart icon is actually meant to indicate underrated, forgotten games that need a chance, then why are the descriptions so short for some of them? Like Clash of Demon Head, Conquest of the Crystal Palace, or Crystalis. The rationale for using this system of icons, instead of grades, is that this era has some games that are foundational and classic, but have not aged well, using Donkey Kong as a specific example. It is important in gaming history with groundbreaking gaming DNA of the princess grabbing gorilla, which is incorrect, by the way, as the game features Pauline, who was never a princess. Amazing how many people still get those wrong, and especially this book's writers, but beside the point, I suppose. Its classic status, I would say, is really more due to its arcade version specifically, so I think they're giving the NES version way too much credit by saying they would give it a 5 out of 5 on a typical scale, but they acknowledge its dated graphics, its rigid controls, and its measly three levels which run in a loop. When you consider that this same generation brings us RPGs like the first Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior or Dragon Quest games, how could a simplistic arcade game, even one as beastly as Donkey Kong, really compare? I think they're overthinking it. And if you ask me, I would guess that they just didn't want to go to the trouble of ranking over 1500 games and deciding between 3 or 3.5 three stars for some inconsequential mediocre game that no one remembers. Like, I don't know, hoops. Who talks about hoops? Anyway, as you can guess by the fact that I could easily compile these collages of games with stars, hearts, and skulls, the majority of games don't have an icon at all. So you don't get a good sense of what games are good and bad, except for the extreme ones. The reviews, or perhaps more accurately, the descriptions and overviews, are exactly as you'd expect, basically just summarizing the game, though many are on the short side, since there can be seven reviews on a page. Also, because there are so many games, there are a few factual errors, which, as you'd probably expect, I'll go into detail later. Errors are also due to translation issues from the original French. There are several, but not prevalent considering how much text there is overall. On the positive side, there is some good information and trivia on occasion. Did you know that Wario's Woods is the only NES game to get an ESRB rating at its initial release? Did you know that the theme song of the atrocious Back to the Future NES game is actually just a sped up version of Power of Love from the movie soundtrack? Speaking of Back to the Future, in part 2, the game Wild Gunman is seen when they visit the 80s cafe on the then future date of October 21st, 2015, which is the day that it was re-released on the Wii U Virtual Console in Europe. And speaking of shooting, everyone wants to shoot the Duck Hunt dog, but did you know that you can shoot the dog in Barker Bill's trick shooting? Some of this I already knew beforehand, but it's nice to see these facts immortalized here. Sort of odd to make a big deal about actor Seth Rogen's tweet about Duck Hunt when he learned the duck could be controlled by a second player but I guess that was indeed a thing that went viral, even though it's right in the manual. Duck Hunt is right across from some Dragon Warrior games, which all have some trivia indicated by a globe icon, multiple bits of trivia even. Unfortunately, these extra nuggets of info don't show up as often as I would have liked. Still, the writing of the main text is interesting enough and sort of refreshing for its occasional bluntness, like when it outright says for Hidlide that it sucks and that Puzzlot is the most stupid puzzle game ever created. These have to be concise, given how many games are being covered, so perhaps that bluntness is just getting to the point to quickly describe a game in a single paragraph. But as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So besides some text, each overview includes one box shot and at least one screenshot. Often the screenshots are rather small and difficult to make out what's going on. Depending on the game, only one image may not give enough of a true sense of what the game is about. That means you would think that in the cases when there are multiple, that would be better. But unfortunately, not so. 
I'll get more into some notable screenshot issues in more detail when discussing the errors in this book. But in short, multiple screenshots are an opportunity often squandered by not actually showing more of the game. After the NES, Famicom, and Famicom Disk System reviews, we take a look at some unofficial games. The formatting is different here, as there is no box art shown. The text is a decent length, comparable to those in the official sections, and longer than several. Plus, the one or two screenshots are actually a decent size. Then we get a look at the classic series and reissues, where we see the box art of re-released games. So if you were wondering why you read earlier about stadium events, but not world-class track meet, and Mike Tyson's punch-out, but not punch-out without him, this is why. They were saved for this section, apparently. The compilation, similarly, looks at cartridges containing multiple games, like the Super Mario Bros. and Duck Hunt combo game pack that many people who got the action set are familiar with. As for me, I got my NES a bit later, so I got the power set that also includes world-class track meet. But from personal experience, I know it absolutely had to have come out well before December 1990. But this book, and unfortunately other sources on the internet, mistakenly think this. Next up are a number of unreleased games. 21 of them get good treatment, like the games in the unofficial game section. Another 12 have no text but a single screenshot, and then a list of 107 games. This list includes the ones previously looked at, and claims to be non-exhaustive. A fair disclaimer because no one can truly know how many unreleased or cancelled games there were. I am not usually a huge fan of sections dedicated to cancelled games in books like this, because it feels like a futile effort, since it can never be surely fully known, and that also makes the book not seem as timeless if more information is found at a later date. But information is still information, and in this case I can at least appreciate the impressive catalogue they have here. Then we have Collector's Treasures. There probably should be an apostrophe here, for special versions and limited editions. In this category, the NES has only had cartridges meant for official competitions, but the Famicom and Famicom Disk System have had quite a number of special edition cartridges. Some of these are colored gold, won in contests, or obtained at special events. Some are promotional, like a version of Gradius that advertises the Archimendes brand of ramen noodles. And now, just a bit shy of three quarters of the way through the book, we move on to the hardware. First, in the foundation of gaming, we learn about video game hardware's origins, from those analog days and up through the arrival of the microprocessor and soon interchangeable ROM cartridges beginning with a Fairchild Channel F. It's really interesting how something like scrolling, which we certainly take for granted, was a big deal when Load Runner was first ported to the Famicom. Then, we get technical in a console as novel as its electronics. A comparison chart shows the tech specs for 1976's Fairchild Channel F up to 1987's PC Engine, or TurboGrafx-16, with the NES and many other consoles in between. We learn about the various processors involved in the NES, and how additional components in the cartridge itself could allow for games enhanced beyond the base capabilities of the console. We continue to nerd out with a very thorough look at the graphics, including how the seeming flaws and defects of composite displays allowed for color blending, which game designers took advantage of. Tiles and palettes are discussed, and scrolling and raster effects. Then audiophiles can enjoy the segment on electronic audio, with information about sound processors and composition techniques. While some of this is beyond me, I enjoyed learning about some of the inspirations for some NES tunes, like the Super Mario Bros. 3 airship theme, inspired by Mars, the bringer of war, from Gustav Holt's orchestral suite, The Planets. or Flashman's theme from Mega Man 2, which borrows from the chorus of Ben Tucker's Coming Home Baby, a classic jazz hit that has been covered by Mel Torme, Quincy Jones, and others. Audio Expansions goes into detail about how Famicom games could have improved audio from special chips, and how the Famicom Disk System expanded the audio capabilities further. While music in current games can sound like something played by an orchestra, or that you might hear on the radio, as there are practically no limits to audio, music for 8-bit game consoles had to be made under strict hardware limitations, so it's actually pretty impressive what is possible. And this distinct sound has led to the chiptune genre, and Famicoms can be used for making such music even today, with these TNS HFC cards. In development kits, we learned that at the launch of the Famicom, there were no officially distributed development kits, and Nintendo's own tools were incomplete and experimental. Later consoles would benefit from having standardized toolkits, but until then, developers designed their own. These four pages take a look at some of them. I think this is pretty impressive to immortalize in a book, as this isn't really something you'd expect to read about, let alone expect the authors to be able to write this much about. 
as old hardware can easily be lost to time. Then we get a 12 page analysis on mappers in Mappers Heart Containers for Cartridges. Basically, mappers organize the memory structure between the console and the cartridge, allowing the game data to be accessed and operated on in ways other than how the original processes are designed. In other words, mappers unlock the potential of this machine. An example they give is that the NES hardware can't handle horizontal and vertical scrolling simultaneously, but a mapper rearranges the data to make that possible. Nintendo of America dictated that only their own mappers could be used for NES games, but the Japanese allowed for each publisher to integrate their own mappers into Famicom games. This leads to some regional differences, like Castlevania III Dracula's Curse being an often cited example, where the original version, Akumajo Densetsu, uses the VRC6 mapper, but upon bringing it to the west, had to use the MMC5 mapper, which, while quite competent since it is the most advanced mapper by Nintendo, does not have as many sound channels as the VRC6, so the music had to be rewritten. As with many Castlevania games, it has an impressive soundtrack, but it is even better in its original form. This section ends with a detailed overview of 10 different stats for 46 different mappers. The Sharp Macomb looks at some other hardware that Nintendo granted a license to to be compatible with Famicom or NES software, including the Sharp C1 and Twin Famicom AN505. There's even a video editing machine for superimposing clips called the Famicom Titler AN510 that is compatible with Famicom games, and the Sharp NES TV released in the United States, which is, as you'd expect, a TV with a built-in NES. Some of these have their own controllers, which have the same buttons, but a unique design. If all of that was a bit too technical, the rest of the hardware chapter is more easily digestible, and a highlight of this book. First, we have the NES in all its forms, with photos and brief descriptions of all these variations of NES consoles. Of course, we know the familiar grey box, and the original Famicom. There are subtle differences between the NES's intended for the A and B regions that Europe is split into, mostly the text on the lid, and then we have the top loader 1993 version of the NES, and the Famicom got a very similar redesign. We see some of those licensed devices discussed earlier, and devices like the M8, M82 and Famicom box, that have multiple games either preloaded or on cartridges, intended for store demos, sort of like the PlayChoice 10 in an arcade cabinet, also seen here. We end the section with the NES Classic Edition, or the NES Mini, as well as its Famicom counterpart, and there's even a Shonen Jump version featuring games based on popular manga. The official controllers looks at various joypads and joysticks, officially from Nintendo, or from Hori, Hudson, and others. There's a controller that is like a remote control for one hand, and a couple that have a large ball as the joystick. The NES Advantage is a popular official joystick, and has a guest appearance in Ghostbusters 2, as shown here. Pilot controls are ready. The official accessories is much the same, this time showing off alternate and unusual input devices, including Rob and the power pad. The power glove by Mattel, yes Mattel, not Nintendo as many people think, is here too, as well as the Miracle Piano, oddly named Piano Miracle here, probably a translation thing. But did you know there is an inflatable motorbike, an inflatable boxer, and controllers specifically for Mahjong and Pachinko? Or the speed board thing, just a flat board to hold your controller still so you can mash buttons better, apparently. There's a barcode battler too for using UPCs, you know, barcodes, in games. I actually have or had a standalone barcode battler, which is pretty neat, don't know where it is. Too bad it repeats the description meant for the turbo file instead, a device for additional save files on compatible games. And then we have a look at a bunch of storage options for your games and gear, including this blue Nintendo bag, that I still have in great shape. The hardware gallery continues with the most unusual, unofficial accessories. Most of us are familiar with the Game Genie cheat device. There are other devices that go between the cartridge and the console to enable the playing of games meant for other regions. Oddly, the Pro Action Replay, which can both cheat and allow the use of games from other regions, isn't here. But we do see a chair where you can lean on a direction instead of pressing on the D-pad, and a macro recorder to replay controller inputs with the touch of a button. There's even a couple modems, though one of them, supposedly allowing crossplay between the NES and the Sega Genesis, somehow, was cancelled. Next are a couple pages of light guns. Almost everyone associates the NES with Duck Hunt, so of course we think of the Zapper, but there are other guns too. The Famicom has more realistic looking guns, but North Americans could get the laser scope, a head mounted scope thing that fires when you shout into the microphone. And finally we have a couple pages of multi-taps, including helpful lists of Famicom and NES games that can support three or four players. The final section of this huge book is a whopping 52 pages of box art, with up to 20 boxes per page. Though we'd seen most of the box art earlier with the reviews, this is a larger look at each one. Unfortunately the Famicom boxes are not seen here, just those for NES games. 
The PAL region is first, with colored abbreviations under each box, indicating which countries each game was released in, since the PAL regions are so fragmented. Then we get American box art. It's a nice gallery for sure, and you know I love box art, but there are a number of things included and excluded that I question, but I'll get into that in a second when I dive into the errors. So this is an impressive book, over 600 pages of NES and Famicom information, but with something this size, there are bound to be some mistakes. Now, as usual for my critical reviews, I'll get into some of the errors I found. It's what I do. If you want, you can jump ahead to the end. I'll probably put a timestamp either here or in the description to let you know how far to jump ahead if you want to skip this. So with that, let's look at the not so great bits. The biggest part is the game review section. So let's start here. This book, like all other anthology books, was originally written in French and there are the occasional translation errors that make this evident. As seen in my review of the Super Nintendo Anthology, that has a habit of saying of racing when they mean of course, which is still here in the NES Anthology, at least in the description for City Connection. That particular error is not so prevalent here, but the big recurring one in this book is the word May. I noticed 18 instances of May being needlessly capitalized, and three instances of May with a Y when it should be M-A-I, and within a word including Adventures of Bayou Billy with the word remaining or Adventures of Lolo with mainly and the Japanese game Maison Ikoku where right in the title it is Maison Ikoku with the letter Y where there should be an I. The fifth month, which is May in English, you may know as May with an I in French, so they might have done some overreaching replace function to capitalize all the months, a theory which has further support in the review for ease. Yes, it's pronounced ease, even though it looks like wise. Quite ironic since we just talked about wise when it should be eyes. Anyway, the ease review not only has that may error in it may seem simple, but earlier in the middle, even though marching on the spot, with March capitalized like the month. They were probably trying to make sure the months are capitalized since the release date is stated in every review's header. And also on that note, the release date is stated as sortie a few times, which is definitely French. Another item in the header box is the genre, which might explain why fighting is also erroneously capitalized in the body text at least three times, including one of the two times we see the strange term fighting end, which was probably meant to be combatant. Metro Cross and Mighty Bomb Jack, only a page apart, both refer to boxings instead of boxes. Also, Zelda 2 is referred to as The Legend of Zelda 2 a number of times, which might be a bit unfair to pick on since the original Japanese title actually does have the the legend of part of the title. The swapping of words like Power Dragon, Loaded Bases, and Piano Miracle is another oddity probably due to mistranslation. And the review for Super Mario Bros. begins by saying, Warning! Cult game! Which I'm not sure is a translation error or sarcasm or some kind of joke. The general tone of the book makes the latter option seem unlikely. Plus, sarcasm based on tone doesn't work well in printed text. However, to be fair, there is a lot that is written here, so looking at the whole book, the translation is still well done overall, and other than these and other minor instances, you would not suspect it had been originally written in anything other than English. But there are some factual errors that are likely not mere translation slip-ups, including the write-up for the Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle talks about pressing down to go upstairs, which is totally not true. The original Japanese version of Famicom Disk System game starring Roger Rabbit instead of Bugs Bunny is said to have had its music changed, but they sure sound alike to me. Maniac Mansion mentions pairing off and two-man teams. While you always have Dave on the team, this is clearly a trio. There is mention of backtracking and non-linearity in Ninja Gaiden 2, which is false. It is said that in Skater Die 2, The Search for Double Trouble, the half-pipe action after the credits would have been appreciated if accessible from the beginning. Which it is, and is by no means a secret. Did they not read the title screen where it says to press select for the ramp? Uninvited's premise is explained as a search for your missing brother, but then it says you have to rescue your sister. The errors aren't limited to software. In the official controllers, it says there's no way to know which connector on the NES Advantage is player 1 or player 2, but there's a stripe on the one meant for player 1. There are a handful of other factual errors, but they are too minor to spend time on here. As with the translation errors, considering how much text is in this huge book, it's actually pretty impressive that there aren't many more. That I noticed, anyway. Perhaps worse than getting some details incorrect, or some layout goofs. There are a few missing or swapped reviews. We don't know what they think about AD&D Dragon Strike, since its review is a repeat of the one for a Japanese-only game, AD&D Dragons of Flame. Euphoria, the saga, 
and You Chosen Cosmo Carrier's reviews are swapped. Besides games, in the official controller section, as mentioned earlier, the description for the Barcode Battler 2 is the description for the Turbo file. Then there are concerns about the screenshots. First, there are some instances of not showing gameplay. Sure, everyone knows what Tetris looks like, but it is a little odd to not show actual gameplay here, even if the score screen showing Nintendo characters is unique. Smash TV gets to have two shots, but neither of them are of actual gameplay. Then, there's a concern about not using multiple shots to show more of the game. Let's take a look at Blaster Master, which has five shots. Take a note of these two. These are of the exact same room. Okay, maybe it's not super evident that this is actually the same ladder if you're not familiar with this game. But, this isn't the only book that has a fixation with this one particular room in Blaster Master, as you'll see in a later review, or when I eventually compare multiple NES books against each other. Regardless, all five screenshots are clearly from the first area, which is a shame considering this game's diverse environments. Now, these three shots are of the same level, the first level of Burger Time. These two screenshots of Booby Kids are also of the same room. You might think, Hey John, give them a break. They had to get screenshots for over 1500 games. Okay, sure, but what about the big name games? As mentioned, the Super Mario Bros. games are among the few games that get a full page, but the choice of screenshots in every one of them is far from super. Three out of seven shots from the first game are from World 3. This world's black sky, along with two other screenshots of underground areas, make this game look really dark. For Super Mario Bros. 2, four of the seven shots are of the very first stage, possibly five out of seven if you consider the character select screen. And Super Mario Bros. 3, one of the most popular NES games of all, gets a whopping nine screenshots, but eight of those nine are from World 1. What a wasted opportunity to show more of this game that has such a variety of worlds, especially since these two screenshots are totally identical. And this screenshot with the Boomerang Brothers, which is an image seen on Giant Bomb and the Super Mario Wiki, isn't even a real screenshot. Even if they're just pulling random screenshots snatched from the web, it should be obvious that almost all of these shots are from the same world since the world number is in the corner of every shot, and you'd think they would give more care to a game that they allowed a whole page for. And the whole thing about having screenshots only of early areas isn't out of a concern for spoilers. Dragon Warrior's very first screenshot is literally of the Dragon Lord in his dragon form, which is the final boss. Metroid also has a shot with the Mother Brain. So if there's no spoiler concern, show more of the game. Other screenshot concerns include the Adams Family Pugsley scavenger hunt, having a screenshot that is a repeat of one that actually belongs to the first Adams Family game, and we don't know what the Famicom Disk System version of soccer looks like, since its screenshot is actually a repeat of the Replicart screenshot. AD&D, Heroes of the Lands, and AD&D, Pool of Radiance have swapped their screenshots as well as their box art. Section Z's box art is actually the box art of SD Gundam, Gundam Wars again. For Millipede, one screenshot is of the North American version, and one screenshot is of the Japanese version, which I'm not sure is an error or not, but it is an odd thing I haven't noticed elsewhere. If I am getting a little too nitpicky, I think you would still agree that the biggest issue, ironically, is that most screenshots are too small. If you think the box art is also small, thankfully there's a box art gallery at the end where you can see them again at a decent size. I did an audit on the US NES cover art and found 13 boxes that probably shouldn't have been included. 10 of these are Tengen Blackheart releases, which are unlicensed. Now I know that Alien Syndrome was released officially by Sunsoft in Japan, same with Rolling Thunder by Namco, but this is called US cover art. These shouldn't be on a list of American official games, but if they are, then every other unlicensed game should also be here. Trolls on Treasure Island is indeed another unlicensed game, but there are certainly more. It really should be all or nothing. Other oddities include Beauty and the Beast and Euphoria, which came out in Europe, but not for North America. Worse than mistaken inclusions are the games that are wrongfully excluded, of which I found 27. There might be some reason that they forgot compilation cartridges like Donkey Kong Classics or re-releases like Punch-Out, but it still seems like a mistake to me, especially since they included them in the PAL region section, so why not here too? Do they have something against kids, like Kid Clown and Kid Nicky, or games meant for kids, including all the Fisher-Price games? In the reviews, they indeed recognize that there are two different NES games of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, one from Taito, and one from Ubisoft. Indeed, their box art is similar, but that shouldn't be a reason to miss one, in this case the Ubisoft one. And since they did choose to include some Tengen games, why not the remaining ones? For Tengen's Gauntlet and RBI Baseball, they use the box art of the unlicensed releases as opposed to the licensed ones. Aside from the absence or presence of the Nintendo Seal of Quality, there's another difference. The unlicensed ones have gold along the left and bottom, 
whereas the licensed versions of these two and Pac-Man show more of the actual art. It's subtle, so it sounds like nitpicking. However, early in the book, they clearly have scans of the licensed versions on hand. Why is Akari Warriors 2 subtitled Road to Victory instead of Victory Road? There are a few spelling errors, mostly inconsequential, like Caesar's Palace, which shouldn't actually have an apostrophe, or Little League Baseball, which has a championship series, not just one series. But misspelling Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Heroes of the Lance with Advanced instead of Advanced puts it far alphabetically from the other AD&D games. With the other errors I pointed out earlier about those AD&D games, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons feels sort of cursed. There are a few other spelling errors, and at least a dozen instances of incorrect alphabetization, even when the title is correct. Anyway, this box art gallery is definitely nice, but not perfect. Which is how I could sum up this whole book. Nice, but not perfect. The reviews are generally short, from being as small as one seventh of a page, with only seven that get a whole page. Over 1500 games are here, including hundreds of Japanese Famicom and Famicom Disk System games that I have not seen described in any other book in English, even if briefly. The screenshots I have nitpicked regarding the choices and scope of them, but ultimately a common issue is that they are too small. But they are a good size for the unofficial and unreleased games. I normally don't love those categories of games and books because they are unlikely to ever be complete, but I have to admit that they certainly have found a lot of information here, to a level that I can appreciate. The collector's treasures portion is especially cool, since most of them are Japanese and not covered in other NES books that I have seen. Comparing to the previous Geeksline Anthology books of the later Nintendo consoles, this is definitely very similar in style and range of topics, but does a few things differently. It goes with the European names of games, instead of North American ones like the other books chose to use. The Star Heart Skull system is interesting, but flawed, with the majority of games not getting any sort of icon. This all comes in one book instead of two, which is maybe not a bad thing in itself, but it is inconsistent with the original releases of the rest of the series. They probably could have done it like the Super Nintendo Anthology and put the software reviews in one volume and the history and hardware in another volume. In which case, I would once again give the hardware and history part a perfect score. Because like those other books, there's an incredible amount of detail, supplemented by so many photos and screenshots. The technical specifications and thorough explanations of graphics and sound and mappers, etc. are all very deep, and the catalogue of consoles, controllers and accessories is unmatched. Even if they're missing the pro-action replay, you have to love all these weird and wacky Famicom accessories, and I bet you wouldn't know that many of these exist until you see them here. So, ultimately, this book excels in its scope. You would probably have no problem finding other books that also review NES games, especially as I've covered and will cover more on this YouTube channel, if you're subscribed, and probably with more text and images, and maybe even a typical score out of 5 stars. But if you want anything else, Japanese games, extremely detailed history, technical breakdowns, images of all this hardware, including rare collectibles and dev kits, most of that I believe can only be found here. I plan to compare multiple NES books in a single video like I did earlier with multiple Super NES books, but I can already say that if you want a comprehensive NES book that goes beyond just reviewing games that everyone is already familiar with, then this is very much a must buy. Some errors with facts, translations, alphabetization, and consistency may stand out to someone like me when reading this from cover to cover, but aren't quite so bad considering the total amount of information packed in here. Though the errors keep it from being perfect, the book is still highly recommended. I'll give it a 4.5 out of 5. If you do want to pick it up, it is available at geeksline-publishing.com, as are their other anthology books which I have reviewed. They have books for some non-Nintendo consoles as well. So that's my take on the Nintendo Entertainment System Anthology. Sorry that this video took so long to make. Besides insisting on reading every single word, there is definitely a challenge in writing out a review and shooting and editing this video. I do have other things that compete with my time, so if you like what I do here, please click that like button and consider sharing this video, and especially subscribing to my channel. I know it sounds like I need validation, but seeing that subscriber number go up is what it takes for me to prioritize setting aside any amount of time for making YouTube videos. Thank you so much for watching this far, and if you have, why not comment below what obscure NES or Famicom games or accessories do you know of that you feel more people should know about? Let's discuss. Alright, that's it for this video. So keep playing, keep reading, and keep geeking out. See ya!